Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Welcome, everybody, to this month's edition of Tech Talk's Lunch Chat. Um, this is a fun one. We have uh, an excellent, uh, I guess, rundown coming. My name is Dr. Brad Brown. I am the medical director for Hint Health, as well as a DPC doc myself in the North Denver area, um, sitting in my clinic, Strive Direct Health. Um, and with us, we have the one and only Dr. Dave. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Dr. Dave. Hey, Dave Cameron. Uh, good to see you again for this Heart Month episode. We're going to be talking about cardiology, about wearables, about cardiovascular biomarkers above and beyond lipid panels. We're going to be talking about VO2 max, calcium scores, and the future of cardiac testing. So I'm sure we're going to have we're going to cover this thoroughly in an hour. Uh, and I'm so excited that we've got. Um, a direct specialty cardiologist. So he is just like us. He is doing direct care. This is Marty Usman, Us Usman uh, in uh, Denver. Uh, and we sent a lot of patients to him and he is our, he's the patient favorite. Uh, and he spent, he, we get, we got our patients in to him uh, within, within a day, within the next day, and he spends an hour with them and our patients rave about him. So he is kind of like direct primary care for cardiology. Uh, welcome, Marty. Um, Marty, would you tell us a little bit about you, about your, your background and your journey from, from fee-for-service through insurance to uh, becoming a direct specialty care cardiologist? I can. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Marty Usman. I, uh, as my journey started, I guess, with, uh, with fellowship, honestly, I did a, an odd fellowship. It was more of a, uh, both molecular inflammatory, uh, research fellowship, um, and also mixed in obviously seeing patients and doing the traditional route as, uh, then came to Colorado in 2004, joined a group, a traditional group that um that was private practice however of course like most states and most cities uh because of uh reimbursements and things along those lines the group decided to merge with another group and then eventually got sold off to a hospital system for which i worked for uh, for a couple of years uh decided at that point that it was worthwhile thinking about doing things differently um, so I went back and doing some inflammatory research as well as beginning to see patients, honestly, uh, seeing patients in their houses, uh, seeing patients online because uh, I didn't have enough to do uh, brick and mortar uh, uh, practice. But in 2018, opened up my own practice that was uh, more of a DPC type of practice. I still see fee for service because um, a lot of times patients don't need a cardiologist on hand. Um, they need to see somebody once or a primary care needs to see somebody for a single consultation and some help in doing something and going forward. While still others, a lot of my heart failure patients see me several times a month and that helps them from going back into the hospital for a lot of different reasons and they get a lot more access, I think, uh, from that standpoint. What are you mainly seeing patients that don't have insurance or are these people that have insurance that are deciding, deciding to see you anyways and paying cash or are they health share or Medicare? It's a big, big mix of people. A lot of people with health shares, a lot of people without insurance. And I still, you know, people who show up with good insurance and Medicare who sign a waiver and say they just want to, they like the fact that I answer the phone and uh, they, I, they can talk to me when they need to. Um, curious, um, pricing. Uh, you've got transparent pricing. Uh, are you, I, I, I didn't ask if this is okay for me to ask you this, but are you, are you willing to share like how do you price it and how do you go about even thinking through pricing with a self-pay rather than insurance? I'm a horrible businessman. Um, so when I started the practice, I looked around town just to see where the, uh, prices were generally for, uh, people who couldn't pay within the systems and I undercut everybody, uh, in that fashion and taking into account what my overhead cost was going to be. That was it. Um, and I was, uh, we were talking a little bit backstage. I think generally speaking, I'm 
doing this practice as more uh, something that I really wanted to do. And I wanted not to over, I'm not earning this, I'm not doing this to earn a lot of cash. So I'm doing this really to, to help people come in to see a cardiologist who couldn't otherwise or couldn't afford it otherwise. So I try to keep every the prices pretty low. Good. Well, thank you for doing that. I appreciate how you've been taking such good care of our patients and making it affordable for our patients. I've, I've got lots of people that have said thank you so much because I know exactly how much I have to pay uh, and they feel like it is a phenomenal value. So. Great. Thank you. Well, should we move into wearables? Let's do it. Hey, Brad, what do you think? What Tell me about wearables in your practice and what your patients are doing and what are, what are they? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, I, you haven't got a bunch of this one, so. <laughs> uh, Sorry, you might hear my dog in the background. <laughs> you all have to be wearable. So if your dog wants one, too. No, um, we have, I mean, pretty much everyone has some type of device, even your phone tracks it all now. So um, in prep for this live stream, you know, I started paying a little closer attention to our patients over the last few weeks. Um, and we've actually had quite a few that, have, you know, that send us their Apple watch data or send me their, you know, their Garmin weight loss trends. Cause there's the, the smart scale through Garmin, things like that. Um, which I personally, sure more data, the better in my opinion, you know, if you're, if you're, thinking about it as a patient, send it my way and we can have that discussion. I'll be a soundboard. So that's kind of how my view on wearables from a 30,000 foot view is, right? It's like, yeah, if you want to dive into that, you know, for the most part, it's not going to do any harm. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll have that discussion. Do you have, do you, Dr. Dave or Dr. Hardy, do you guys have any patients that you specifically say, hey, you should have a wearable of some sort so we can track X, Y, Z? You know, I actually had this conversation with a guy. He's a, a basketball player, and he was having some. It wasn't really shortness of breath, but he was just having a difficult time. He said a difficult time uh, catching his breath or taking a deep breath, uh, mm -hmm. and he was worried about his heart. And he was, you know, worried. Gosh, is this asthma or is there something else going on? And so I said, well, well, what does your wearable tell you? What's what are your vitals? What's your O2 sats? And he goes, well, I don't have one. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who who is not usually sending me this kind of stuff? I mean, I I've got so many people that bring in, and, and I've I've sent some people that uh, to Marty who, you know, they they go, gosh, I've got an arrhythmia uh, on on my on my wearable, or I've got atrial fibrillation, or you know, I've got some some other abnormality that they're worried about, or their HRV, uh, and. And so, and I actually have one guy that I saw a few weeks ago and he had, I think he had a whoop on one side and his Apple watch on the other and he was comparing them. Uh, and so, you know, we actually just did some, as we were preparing for this, we had a bunch of our, our, our staff, we all have kind of d the different wearables and we were comparing the blood pressures, O2 sats uh, between a, a standard uh, manual blood pressure cuff versus what you get off of the watch. I was really impressed at how accurate they were. Um, O2 sats seemed to be a little bit, lower with the finger probe and maybe that was temperature uh, related but i found that the pulse at least the pulse the blood pressure and the oxygenation o2 sat was was pretty was pretty accurate marty what what is your experience with accuracy on wearables it depends on what we're talking about so as far as heart rate so i get a lot of patients who come in and say my heart rate's out of whack when i'm on the treadmill uh, so as soon as I walk on, start running on the treadmill, my heart rate goes up to 200. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound quite right. Um, and they're convinced. So of course, what I end up doing is putting them on the treadmill with some of the leads on and we compare the two. And of course it's just artifact, uh, that's happening. And so trying to make sure that people have a good, uh, outlook on what is really possible with these and it's, while the devices themselves are fantastic, how the people wear them is something else. And so people who don't like to wear their watches tight on their wrists are going to have a lot less accuracy than other people are going to have. Um, and as far as the heart rates are controlled, there really is a problem. Um, the I actually like to see the EKGs. And some of these watches have fantastic true EKGs, the Cardia devices. 
Um, the Apple Watch itself is based on the Cardia device, I believe. And uh, they do a, a fairly good job, at, at, at least at rest, um, showing me a good rhythm strip. You know, of course, everything when you're running and jogging and things along those lines are going to be somewhat problematic. Um, the HRV, HRV has a lot of data to it and how we're going to use it, how people use it is really dependent on, on what, the under, what the person is, all their prior uh, history. And also really how the programming is on that particular watch. Is it a 24 hours at a 30 day HRV? If you look at the Garmin, the Garmin won't even calculate an HRV for you for days um, before it gets data. So, and then you have other watches that will give you an instantaneous uh, HRV. So all these things will pretend different aspects of your health. Hey, uh, you're on mute. It's 2024. I should know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> I had a patient recent, uh, last week or so say, hey, I just have my watch. Why do I need to go get a event monitor, you know, a halter for the lack of better term, I, you know? Yeah. I, uh, people have come in to see me for palpitations and it, we have a large discussion usually as to when are the palpitations occurring, how frequently are they occurring and for how long do they occur? And if it's the right type of symptom, then remember, you got to get to the watch. You got to pull up the right program. You got to put your finger on it and, and be in a steady place and put your hand down and put all that stuff. Um, if it's lasting long enough that you can do all that, I'm, I'm great with it. I'd rather, and I tell people, you know, and some of my patients, I, I tell them, you know, I've got a great monitor. You can wear it, you know, the week, the, the uh, regular holter is 75 bucks. The, uh, the week monitor is 150 bucks. And I said, you know, if you go out and buy yourself an iWatch, it's a, uh, it's going to be a $500 purchase. However, you get an iWatch at the end. Yeah. Uh, and you can do this whenever you want to. So, and a lot of people will just decide to go ahead and get that. Um, so these, uh, again, it, it, you have to be careful about, or you have to warn them that you have to be careful about these single palpitations or I get a, a palpitation. You don't know when it's going to come up. It's probably not particularly appropriate for the eye watch or for the cardia device. How but, accurate, how accurate is the AFib on some of these devices? The yeah the iWatch and the Cardio device are incredibly accurate. In fact, it's an EKG, uh, or it's a not an EKG, it's a rhythm strip, and you can follow it. Now, whether it is good at detecting AFib, in other words, when it warns somebody that you might have AFib, it doesn't. It actually you need to have somebody look at it. Um, so you can they can pull it up, they can send you the PDF of the rhythm strip, and you can take a peek at it and make sure that it really is what it says it is. But as far as the analysis, as far as the actual rhythm strip, it's a pretty good rhythm strip. In fact, I had somebody come in, I can't remember the brand. I'd never heard of it before. And she came in with a book of rhythm strips and they were beautiful. Um, I thought, well, this is great. We won't do it on my own. Uh, I, I won't give you anything. And we'll just leaf through this thing. Nice. You, you mentioned HRV. Would you mind just telling our, uh, our audience what is HRV? Uh, why do we care? How does it impact health and how you use it? Sure. Um, so basically, you know, uh, a heart rate should vary um, and beat to beat should be varied. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's part of a normal, um, normal heart, um, a normal heartbeat and electrical system. And when that doesn't vary well, or, then it can pretend a uh, an issue. Um, so there's normal HRV, there's abnormal. I think uh, basically it's it's hard to know exactly where this, where the abnormal lies, but usually it's about 50. Um, HRV is dependent on, a lot, a lot of times it can be dependent on your overall health, um, but it can be affected by other things. Um, the um, core body temperature it can be circadian rhythms, metabolism, affects the sleep cycle, um, even the renin angiotensin system. Um, and again, uh, heart rate variability is what it stands for. And there's a, 
there's an idea that if it's too low, so you're not, the heart rate variability is not really occurring uh, very well, then it uh, leads, or the prognosis to, for somebody is less um, than whether it's in the normal range. I don't think there's a whole lot of data on if it's too high or not, although people do use that um, when uh, they're in training, although the to not overtrain. Um, but the data on that's sort of sparse. Um, the large amount of data is really doing HRV uh, measurements post MI. And this has been around forever. Um, and so if you have a, an HRV that's, that's uh, significantly low after you've had a heart attack and done uh, your normal repair, then it has a worse prognosis than if your HRV is normal, but it does give you a something to strive for in your exercise program. And things get better. So you know, couch potato versus somebody who's running around, a couch potato is going to have a worse HRV than somebody who does normal exercise. And so it gives people a good, uh, a good way to uh, measure and see how they're doing. Yeah, I got a, uh, a patient that tells me when he's about to get sick. Because he's like, oh, hey, my HRV is dropping. Uh, I'm about to get sick. And he, and he's not, for him, his HRV drops before he gets like his cold. Um, and, and he's like, okay. <laughs> and so that was helpful. And the other thing is, is re you mentioned this. And I think uh, my experience is that most of my patients, they use their HRV for recovery uh, after their workout. Um, and how long it takes for their HRV to recover after they've had a hard workout. <laughs> um They've used that to be, to be a measure for for how hard to work and how much time to recover. Sure. Do you use this clinically? That data is there anything that you do differently in your practice with HRV data? I don't do a lot differently with that. It, like I said, it does, uh, for, especially for my patients who have significant coronary disease post MI. It gives me something to measure. Um, I don't typically go in that route. Um, I'm usually trying to get people to even get up and get around. So the HRV data doesn't really help me to, to modify their exercise at all. Um, the, the, so it's difficult, although people do come in with the HRV data. And so we have to go through the explanation as to how, how, how best to use it and whether or not they're overutilizing it. Yeah. Got a question for you both. Um, how do you use the sleep data from the wearables? Okay. I have uh, I have problems with the sleep data because the sleep data is really dependent on so many other factors. Um, and it all depends on the, what kind of sleep data it gives you. I think the, the Garmin that I have gives you a whole lot of sleep data and it changes, it could be doing the same thing night to night and it gives me date, different data. So I don't know exactly Honestly, I don't know how to use it um, and whether it's particularly useful. You know, when it, get, it comes down to it, I will. Uh, I have a little uh, ring that I'll give to people that uh, is basically an overnight sleep oximetry. And uh, that's what, really is this a, an Ura ring or is, what kind of ring is this? No, this is uh, this is an actual uh, sleep oximeter, but I okay. can't think of the brand. I can I'll look it up here soon, but. It's a brand that it literally is just a ring and it gives you great data for just an, it is truly an overnight sleep oximeter. Okay. So um, do you find that if someone is using their, their Apple watch and they're checking their O2 sat overnight, would you trust that? Or do you want this um, sleep ring for O2 sat monitoring? Well, I think you mentioned before that the oxygen saturation is a little different on the watch than if you put on your finger or other device. Um, if you're looking for absolute numbers, it may not be the best thing uh, overnight. I, I have also put uh, the, the oxygen ring on, on me while I've been measuring my Garmin um, and they were off by by 5%. Okay. Um, so if we're really gonna do treatment, I would not do the, I obviously wouldn't go toward the watch. Um, the uh, th that would be probably a mistake. Okay. 
But as variations go, you can sort of see people start off regardless at 95% and they drop 10%, um, you know, there's an issue. And that's when I would go down the road of getting a more of a formal evaluation done. How about sleep stages? How I don't know the answer to this. I know that like the watches use gyroscope accelerometers and HR uh, heart rate for determining the sleep stage, uh, whether people are awake or asleep. Do you do you have any idea how accurate they are in terms of sleep stage compared to doing a formal sleep study? I, uh, I was again, this is all for, for myself more than it was for anybody else. I don't have that many people coming in with their watches talking about sleep in my practice, but I did look it up just to see if it was accurate because it kept telling me that I was never in a REM sleep. I'm like, I, I know I dreamt. So <laughs> this can't be completely right. And it's, uh, I, I don't know how accurate it is. I know that there's a lot of data on the, what they use, uh, a lot of studies on how, how they do it. I just don't, I just can't tell you uh, how accurate it is though. Okay. I'm, a, I'm on the side of, um, err on the side of caution. You know, I'm like, ah, it's, it could be okay, but let's do a formal sleep study if you're really worried about it, you know, just because, yeah, mine, mine is the same way. Some nights it'll say, you slept great and I was up with our baby for five hours. And I'm like, no, I, I didn't sleep great. Maybe I was asleep, who knows? But, um, <laughs> you know, or, you know, you didn't sleep, you know, I think it has a lot of, you know, if my wife moves around a lot, I think it senses that sometimes. I don't know. I, 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 I'm with you, Dr. Murray. I think there's a lot of variables in the sleep side of things that if, if treatment, if it's going to change the course of what, you know, the plan with treatment or not treatment, definitely get a, a formal, a formal study. Yeah. Now I've got nothing to disclose. I don't know if either of the two of you have got, um, you know, uh, disclosures, but do you have, is there a best wearable out there? What are we, what are we recommending people to, to pick up for themselves? Oh boy. My, my mom's going to roll her eyes right now when she's watching this. I have nothing to disclose, but I'm a huge Garmin fan personally. I, I love them. Okay. And she's a, she's a very staunch Apple watch person. So we, you know, opposites attract, but <laughs> I, uh, I actually sold my Apple watch to get the Garmin. Um, yeah. and, I'll, I'll put a caveat to this. I was training for, it was a triathlon and the Garmin has a much more robust programming for things like that. So I don't think that necessary for an EKG go with the Apple watch because I think it has a better one, but, and, but for the heart rate, oxygenation and all the other small programming, I, I like the Garmin better. Okay. What about range? Really good too. Whoop, the whoop band is really yeah, good. Uh, yeah, the whoop band looks great. I've never actually done that. Yeah. Um, a lot of athletes will use forward. the whoop. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think that's a membership, if I remember correctly. That's a monthly fee that goes along with the whoop. Hey, we're very pro monthly fees here in this group, right? It's not kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Just kidding. Uh, Hey, what um, about interface? You mentioned interfaces, Brad. How good are the interfaces between wearables and our EMRs? Yeah, there's definitely a few out there. Um, it mainly started with Fitbit was kind of the first one that made it easy to interface. Um, and then Garmin kind of had an open API type of thing. Apple, as we all know, Apple is pretty much a closed book across all their products. It's kind of, it's hard to get a direct integration with them. Um, but uh it's my experience is the data that comes into the EMRs is no different than what the, the patient would print off an email to you anyway. And so it's, I'm not going to go very rarely. I would never say never. I would never go into a patient's chart and be like, Oh, I wonder what their HRV was, you know, last week. You know, I, I would, it's more of when someone sends me something, Hey, this is what I'm seeing. Here's my palpitations or um, something like that. So I don't know how useful those in my, in my, practice in my opinion i don't know how useful those integrations are because when people have a question i'm not actively monitoring their heart rate i don't have like a you know a telly the telly room and on the floor you know in the ward of everyone that's on telly everyone that has a wearable i'm not looking at that constantly so when someone's concerned they just send it to me i feel like that's just as good as an integration but mm -hmm. you know, to each their own pretty much is it worth it 
I mean, do you find that the effort it takes to make an integration between a patient's wearable and your EMR, is it worth the, the hassle? For two part answer for my practice? No, but we have, we do have quite a few, not quite a few, you know, a small number of people that ask that, Hey, do you integrate with fill in the blank? You know, um, and we're like, oh, not at this time. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a, a deal breaker for anyone. Um, but, uh, I, I personally think it's, it's a nice to have, it's not a, a necessity for your EMR, right? It's like, oh, that's a cool feature, you know? So we got a question here. Uh, Mr. Alex, I have never explored. Have you explored with, with it? No, nope. I have not. No, nope. well, that was kind of a anticlimactic answer. Darn it. We're not. <laughs> uh, anybody in the audience have any experience they want to put in the, in the comment? Uh, and while we do that, any last uh, parting comments on wearables before we talk, start talking about cardiovascular biomarkers? I will say, in the interest of story time, just to give someone, if they're typing, a second. I have, um, I'm allowed to tell the story because the mom of the child is very open and loves telling the story. And she said I can share it too. Um, a couple of years ago, on when one of my kids was really little, he had a teammate on his soccer team. And they, were, they had a practice one evening in the summer and then went home and the mom texted me later, hey, his heart rate's like 220. And I was like, well, it's probably artifact, just like you said, Dr. Martin, you know, no, we put the Apple Watch on, it's, it's 220 and he's pretty short of breath. I was like, well, shortness of breath is not really artifact. <laughs> so coming over to the clinic, they only live a mile away. Um, let's, let's get an EKG, you know, that's, that's the formal thing. And sure enough, I mean, he had full blown, it, he was tacking along quite nicely. Um, I called Children's, uh, their doc line, talked to the cardiologist. Um, sure enough, he had, you know, Wolf Parkinson White, went right to the ER and had it ablated in a few hours. So it was actually really cool um, that, you know, the Apple Watch on, was like, he's not kidding. Like, this is actually, um, he's really going for it, just sitting on the couch. So it wasn't directly a wearable, but she put that on and was like, hey, it's not just my fingers feeling, you know, it's carotid. It's, it's actually calculating it really fast. So um, we were just the... The conduit. Okay, time to go to Children's right away, please. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was awesome, and she's you know forever grateful and everything. She would have called us on her way to Children's anyway, but um, it, was, it was you know a testament to a wearable, I guess. So yeah. Well, well, as oh here we go. Uh, any thoughts in the outlet for babies or mm -hmm. recent FDA approval? Uh, that is out of my league uh, when we start talking about babies. I don't know, Dr. Dave, what do you think? Anything? I have my opinion. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to pass on that one too. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really cool. However, I think it requires a little bit of training for the parents because, you know, seeing a baby's you know, pulse ox dip at night can freak parents out, you know, especially if it's their first baby or something. I mean, you're already hyper fixated on the baby anyway. Um, and so it almost causes more sleep loss for the parents than necessary. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it is um, headed in the right direction. I don't know if it's quite dialed in totally right yet, just because it causes a little more stress than than necessary. Ooh, any recommendations for in-office 12 lead with readings? Well, um, go inexpensive, number one. Um, I, there's not a whole lot of reason to, unless depends on what you, what you want to portray. To people, um, I have one that's uh, that literally goes into my computer and it's uh, cordless, and I do that for a lot of different reasons. Um, but the older EKG machines, the ones you can purchase off eBay if you're trying to save money and those kinds of things, are all perfectly good. They use a lot of the same programming. It might be plus or minus uh, a little bit. Um, the old brand, all the old brands are just fine. Uh, as long as you get a good, uh, number one, as long as you get a reading with it, unless you uh, are trained and, and like to read EKGs. I always recommend to people, though, don't just get an EKG and not know how to read them because you can't trust, I don't care how good the EKG uh, advertisements are, you never trust the the computer read on an EKG other than normal. And even then sometimes normal is not really normal. 
I agree. I, well, let's, I can let's, let's, let's transition over to um, uh, some biomarkers. I know one of the things that a lot of patients come to me, they have all read this book right here, Peter Atia Outlive. And they're like, hey, I want to do medicine 3.0. I want these labs. I want a calcium score on a VO2 max and a body composition scan. So, so um, this is something I think a lot of, of us in the DPC world have experienced where patients are, are reading Peter Atia, they're listening to Andrew Huberman podcasts or David Sinclair, uh, and they're wanting to think about how we can live longer and stay healthier for longer. So let's dive in. I know we've spent lots of time talking about lipid panels. Let's 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 skip over lipid panels, but but let's talk about things like ApoB testing, about lipoprotein little a, um, high sensitivity, high sensitivity CRP, homocyte, those types of things. Um, I know ApoB in this book gets a lot of um, airtime. How do you use ApoB? Um, is it something that is a practice changer for you? Uh, and do you have specific targets that you shoot for? And how do you achieve those targets? Well, um, it's not, it, it, it's something that I will get. Um, it's not something that is directly a target, mainly because a lot of my patients have as we were talking about LDLs that are out of range when I first see them. Um, so my first target is that LDL. Yeah. Um, and then comes the April B. So I do get the April Bs. I take a look at them. Um, it's great for risk assessment, particularly with people who have high triglycerides, people who have diabetes, metabolic syndrome, really low LDLCs as well. So then your risk is, you're thinking the risk is gonna be higher. Um, it's a good measurement uh, if, you, if you really want to reduce the risk uh, quite a bit. So you can, if people are willing to take medicines, which is the other problem that I find in, in my current practice is that Everybody wants the test done. Nobody wants to take a medicine, um, which means uh, what are we going to do with this? Um, we're going to talk about diet and exercise by and large, but if, why are we getting, if we're not going to go down the road of fixing what the issue becomes or we find, then how, what's, what's the point of this? Um, April B being one that we can actually treat with statins again, there's not anything specifically more uh, direct toward the April B, uh, but I do find that people begin to get these tests and they don't want to do any changes. Okay. Um, lipoprotein little A is another one that people get all the time. And I find that it's there to scare people a lot. It's worthwhile getting, but we don't have a good medicine to lower it. I mean, a lipoprotein A is there from age five and doesn't change unless you're ill. Um, so what are we going to do with that until we have, and there are, there are medicines in, in the pipeline for these kinds of things, but nothing there that's going to substantially change other than diet and exercise. Um, and even then the life protein A is really not going to change that much. So I think the current recommendations, at least the European recommendations are to get it at least once in a lifetime and not to follow that one. For ApoB, you can follow it and you can treat it. And like I said, for the, these different uh, comorbidities, it might be even better to treat the ApoB with, again, an appropriate medicine over and above the diet and the exercise, which obviously is the first thing that we want to, we want to impress people about. And uh, I usually take this step by step. The diet and the exercise comes first and then we come back and retest. And we see what the best case scenario is for somebody. A lot of people will come back and say, you know what, I can't increase any more than what I am, uh, or I'm not going to increase it any more than what I am. And uh, then, then we start talking about medicines. Okay. Well, you know, interesting enough, so going back to ApoB, our lab will say if it's desire, desirable, it'll be less than 90. Uh, and then, Intermediate is between 90 and 130, and then high risk is over 130. First off, do you agree with those um, those lab value um, normals? And if so, and, and, by, and I think my patient panel is probably 
quite different than yours. A lot of people come to me saying, I want to do everything possible to keep my heart with a calcium score of zero. They want to keep their arteries clear. Um, and so that's the patient panel that I have. Um, and so, and they're like, how, what, what do I need my APOB to keep my coronaries clean? That, <laughs> how, well, would answer, how would you answer that? I wouldn't. Um, I'm going to scare these people a little bit away from that, uh, that line of thinking. Um, I, again, I go down the idea that diet and exercise are our best, our best methods for doing everything. Um, if we're really looking to reduce our risks quite a bit, um, we can take a, again, we don't have the same data for the LDL that we have for the April B. So to say that we need that at a certain number, Again, we change that even with looking at LDLs. Um, we don't have specific numbers for people. We start talking about a reduction of 50%. With uh, So whatever you were, it wasn't good enough. You know, in my patient population who've already had the MI, we're talking about high, high intensity statins to reduce you by 50%. Um, so it doesn't matter what you, where you were before. Uh, so the APOB, Again, we don't have the kind of robust data to say uh, we need to get you from this number to this number for you to have a zero calcium score. It, that just doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I, I get that. And I, I try to defer to my cardiology colleagues like yourself. And I can't quite get the answer. Yet. I think we have to get the wait, wait until we get the data. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, we can use it to help people lower, lower their risk some. But yeah, there's not a there's not a method to correlate at the moment between that and keeping things clean um, as far as the, the calcium scores are. Calcium scores are a whole different animal in itself. Now there's more data on the CRP. Should we dive into to CRP and how you use CRP and and how first off we're gonna talk a little bit what is CRP and and how is it related to atherosclerosis uh, and and how we can use that for management? Yeah, so CRP is wonderful. Um, if people wanted to look up good lectures and things like that, I would look up Paul Ridker, uh, who was the, the uh, basically the scientist that did all the work on CRPs, HSCRPs, and how they correlate with risk. Um, he's also the person who came, who is still delving into um, a, another concept, which would be those people who have coronary disease and are on optimal medical treatment, uh, have a residual risk, call it, and we call we're calling it now the residual inflammatory risk. And so, this inflammatory uh, problem that we that CRP is denoting um, really is a good one. Not again, the inflammatory risk we can't actually treat. For, uh, for people who have had coronary disease who continue to have uh, lesions and, and problems. Um, the, that kind of medication um, is difficult. Um, we don't have a lot right now, but they're all coming again down the pipeline. CRP in itself is great for denoting, um, again, risk over and above what our LDL is. Um, so I do get that for my patients. Um, I tend to get the CRP to denote uh, risk in somebody who has a normal, what I like term normal uh, LDL uh, or normal uh, uh, profile uh, to denote more risk than what we, that's going to show me. And that's when we start talking about other things we need to do. Um, I'd get that along with, depending on the age of the patient, I'll get the calcium score. So let me just make sure I understand. So if someone is has got a normal LDL, but would it be the patient that's got the family history of cardiovascular disease that you're like, hey, this is probably our target patient to get the CRP? Or are you getting a CRP across the board for your patients? Um, or is there a specific target? I get it to determine whether or not I've got uh, somebody who needs uh, better treatment for a for their cholesterol. I'll put it that way. Now, whether it's uh, they, these are the 
added risks that people uh, may have that might say that a normal cholesterol panel doesn't give me the uh, give, it doesn't appear to be giving me the same information. These are the same people who want to get their ApoBs and ApoAs done, or lipoprotein A's done, um, that want the best uh, care possible. Then the CRP will add more data to somebody who may be at uh, risk. Again, we're calculating risk usually. So uh, the ASCVD risk panel, so the calculation that we generally will do to determine if you're between a 5% and a 20% risk index. If you're between, uh, if you're at 7.5 and up to 20, we start talking about uh, putting you on cal uh, cholesterol medicines. If you're below that, then we want to know whether or not you have things that pretend worsening prognosis. And this is where CRP is going to help out. Uh, this is where a calcium score helps out. This is where a lot of the other data that you get just from a just from a uh, uh, an interview with the patient, uh, what their history is, whether they have a family history of coronary disease. So CRP is an additive to what we currently do. We don't obviously we don't treat CRP. CRP is not the thing to be treated in itself. Um, interestingly enough, well, some of the treatments that are underway are those things that led to CRP. So uh, this is probably going way too in depth, but interleukins go to interleukins that go onto CRPs and there are medications that treat the interleukins. Um, and that has actually resulted in some interesting data. Um, again, these are, uh, these were big trials that were done a couple of years ago. What about colchicine? I know colchicine has become a hot topic for anti-inflammatory and CRP. What's your take on colchicine? Colchicine is definitely a medicine that can be given uh, for those, as I was telling in the very beginning about the residual inflammatory risk. So once you're on all the medicines at a, the best levels that you can be on, the best medicines you can be on, you're still having heart attacks. We denote that as probably having a, a residual inflammatory risk. And this is where that specifically has, is begin, beginning to be given more commonly. Um, again, there's a, there are risks with giving any medicines and a re, there's a renal risk in that as well. So uh, you have to be somewhat careful in giving that medicine. But uh, generally speaking, it's a good one to give. Okay. And again, there are multiple medicines that are in the works, whether they actually... Uh, come out in the next few years, who knows? How about homocysteine? <laughs> uh, what are your, what's your take on homocysteine? Uh, I don't have a big take on homocysteine. Um, again, something that I see coming in, but uh, how I use it over and above as a marker for those people who end up in that category of should I treat them for cholesterol or not? Should I give them a little bit more of a boost? That's how I generally will, uh, will take the homocysteine uh, data. So you will use it as an additive mark marker to push you to either be more aggressive in your therapy or not? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's really listed as one of those risk enhancing factors. I don't think that it is, but it's something that gives puts a little bit of uh, idea in my head that I might be, might be, I should look for other things as well. Okay. Well, and also, you know, I, I don't know if the studies actually show that if you reduce the homocysteine, it actually improves the cardiovascular disease, or is it just an innocent bystander as a marker? Do you have an opinion on that? I don't have any more opinion than what, what you just said. I think that the questions are still out there. You know, there there's, there's, there are, there are markers and there are uh, targets for disease and um, where all these things is, it's, it's kind of like HSCRP. We don't treat HSCRP, but it's a fantastic marker. Um, so how does homocysteine play a role? Um, uh, and how do we actually target that? Even if it was a target, it would be the, the next step. There are there any other markers we should talk about before we talk about calcium scores? Uh, 
I'm not sure that there's another one that's really uh, that's common, at least beyond the obvious. Um, we've already talked about uh, like protein A and and ApoB. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's see. So I just had my calcium score last year. I don't know. I picked when I turned 50. Uh, and so I went to our local independent um, standalone uh, radiology center. It cost 110 bucks. Wasn't covered by insurance. And, it, and I asked, I actually reviewed it with the radiologist uh, and wanted to make sure how much radiation I was getting. It was 0 0.6 millisievert, so about six chest x-rays worth of radiation. Um, so anyways, I got lots of people to come in and they want a calcium score. Um, tell me, what are your thoughts about calcium scores? Who should get one? Uh, how do you interpret the results? So they're incredibly useful. I use them a lot for primary prevention. Secondary prevention, they're useless. Um, we're not going to do anything differently. We're going to teach you the top level. You already have coronary disease. Why are we getting a calcium score? Um, so, but or you already have a stent. Why are we getting a calcium score? Calcium scores are useful um, when we're trying to determine, again, treatment. Um, a zero calcium score is great, you know, for somebody who's on, who's on the fence for getting any kind of a treatment over and above zero, then it becomes a question. There are times that we see the calcium scores that are incredibly high, um, in which case, in, and not only is it a treatment uh, change for most people who get that, but there are times where I see people over a thousand with calcium scores and I go down the road of testing uh, for people just to make sure that we're not missing something uh, that they're not telling me or, you know, if they actually are having symptoms and don't really think they're symptoms because um, we really do need to define that. The problem with calcium scores is that it does, the negative predictive value is still somewhat questionable because obviously we have a uh, soft plaque. So the age of your patient getting a calcium score is going to be important. You know, the, the older you are, the more likely it is that your plaque is going to be calcified. The younger you are, the, the less likely it's going to be that way. So um, it is important to, to have the right age range and pursuing the calcium scores or at least trusting a, a negative calcium score to be absolute, to be actually negative. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I was reading this article uh, from JACC from 2018 and it put, it had four different categories of, of um, groups. There was calcium score of zero between one and a hundred, 101 to 400, another one greater than 400. And really if calcium score is zero, the, the risk for those on statins and and not taking statins, they're identical. Um, so statins didn't really seem to help, at least for the first 12 years. And it was very minimal for those between one and 100, but then it really diverged once the calcium score was greater than 100. And so what I took away from that was, gosh, you know, if someone's calcium score is greater than 100, I should really encourage them to go on a statin. Now, is that how you interpret the calcium scores as well, or do you think about it differently? Those are our current guidelines. Um, the, uh, they really say that anything over one, you have to somewhat question, but obviously a zero and a one is not going to be a, it's, there's, it's just more of a cover your butt kind of <laughs> statement. I think the, I, uh, I think the, the reason for getting a calcium score would be to determine whether or not you actually need to be on a, on a statin, or if you're already on a statin, do we need to get you on a bigger statin? Um, and the quartile system is, is perfectly valid. And that's basically what we're, what it's been for quite a, quite a few years. Um, so anybody with, with, uh, higher calcium scores. And as you said, over a hundred is definitely a discussion to be had, uh, with, uh, with the patient as to whether or not they would be a, a good with starting a moderate dose, um, uh, uh statin. Those that are already at high risk um, by the scoring over 20% um, don't really need a calcium score because uh, we're not really going to do too much about it, uh, so too much differently about it. And I do find that people who are already over 20% or their calcium scores are already at 
450 or whatever it is, they want to get their calcium scores multiple times. And I have to tell people, you know what, that's really irrelevant. It's irrelevant information. It's not going to give us anything further for you at the moment. Um, following a calcium score is, can be done for the people who are in that intermediate range. Um, but things aren't going to go, things aren't going to go away. Um, so don't expect a 450 to suddenly become 200. Right. Do you see that the calcium score goes up a little bit with the introduction of a statin? I haven't followed that. So I haven't seen any data that says that. So I don't know. I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, Again, the way the, cal the way calcification works is as we as we age and as cells turn uh, to having calcium to becoming more calcific, calcific um, it's obviously going to go up. The scores are going to go up, and part of what we do with statins is stop the progress um, of plaque formation, but it doesn't necessarily really reduce the plaque that's there. So that plaque might actually more calcify, which is to some degree a stable plaque, but this is not a, uh, 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 plaque that we, at least it's a plaque that we can see. Right. So is that why, cal why statins, um, stabilize plaque? Is it because they are calcifying the, the fibrous plaque or the fatty plaque there so that it's less likely to rupture? I'm not going to be able to answer that one very well. Um, there's a lot of reasons why statins work and they said they work better than other drugs, more tradi uh, prior traditional drugs that are, that are there. And part of that's the, the anti-inflammatory effect of, uh, of the statins as much as it is lowering the actual LDL. Okay. And if for those that have, let's say someone has got a calcium score of 50, um, would you recommend that that person would get a repeat calcium score at some point? And if so, what would be the frequency? Not below. I usually go out about five years on, uh, on people who are, we're not really doing any, any management except for diet and exercise. And it does, there's not a whole lot of reason to, as long as people are keeping up with trying to take care of themselves. Should we move on to VO2 max? Let, let's, let's do it. Talk about VO2 max. You've got, you do VO2 maxes. How do you use them in your practice? And what, what's yeah, that? I will, I will be doing VO2 max. Oh, you will uh, be doing them. Yeah. I will be doing them. I have not yet. I am in the process of getting the machinery to do it. Uh, with, so my practice for your knowledge is sort of moving from a traditional brick and mortar practice into a actual gym. Um, a friend of mine has bought and has manages a, uh, 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 a whole gym uh, with a lot of athletes and other people that need to and would like to know their VO2s. I have a whole lot of patients, obviously, in my practice that are trying actively to lose weight and to begin an exercise program. Um, and there's a lot of things about a VO2 max that can help both from the athletic or the real athletes down to those people that are, uh, that are really wanting to determine where along their exercise regimen are they burning fat and where are they burning carbs. And so a VO2 max with a VCO2 can give you uh, what is called the RER. Um, uh, what is basically is a uh, is determining where along the lines you're actually burning which kind of uh, uh, energy, um, so fats versus carbs helps out quite a bit. Um, also helps pretend you know for my uh, for my heart patients with heart failure where they are on a on a line of uh, of health. Um, gives another measure other than an EF. So are you using it primarily for athletes that want to know what their maximal cardiovascular output is, or are you doing it for risk stratifying for cardiovascular disease, or is it mainly people that are wanting to lose weight or kind of all of the above or all of the above? Okay. It's a measure of cardiovascular fitness. 
and cardiovascular endurance, uh, all these kinds of words for it, aerobic fitness. And so I have a lot of people who just want to know more about their overall health. And this is pretty, uh, pretty refined data that you can use and go forward with. And so a lot of the same people that you've seen trying to get their uh, ApoBs down, this gives a quite a bit more information for those people who are really trying to impress and change their athletic abilities, um, seeing how they are actually increasing their aerobic capacities throughout their stay in, in uh, trying to lose their weight, trying to make sure that they're actually doing the right things along the way. Yeah. It gives a lot of trainers something to actually work with. One of the things that Peter talks about um, in his book is that uh, the VO2 max is a really good uh, indicator for longevity uh, health and health span. Uh, we all lose our VO2 max as we age. Um, but as we, if we are able to keep that elevated, if we stay at a higher level, it helps us stay healthier longer. Uh, and it's one a, a remarkably good marker for staying, keep, keeping healthy late into our 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and so I've got some patients that just want to know, like, how am I trending? Uh, they want to get it at least once a decade or I, I remember when I did my VO2 max, I, I was, I mean, it was to failure. <laughs> it's not, it was not it a pretty, pretty comfortable test. It uh, should be. And so just to warn everybody, if they haven't done it before, VO2 max is not a comfortable test. If you think a stress test is bad, a VO2 max is that one step above. Um, right. now the way I actually do it for some patients um especially like i have a few coronary disease patients um that want to actually do all and really get back into athletics um i will put they are on the treadmill with the leads on so i'm doing a treadmill test along with their vo2 max test um and we get a lot of data for it but it is definitely in order to get a true vo2 max you're going to failure yeah and um, do you find that most patients are um, able to do that? Are they able to complete the test or do you have to cut them off because they're about to pass out or <laughs> what's your experience with that? Well, if they're about to pass out, they got to the failure part. That's um, right. Okay. Uh -huh. So, you know, they're, they're all good. I think that uh, I do have to warn people again. I, I did them in the past. I haven't done them in a while. The people that the athletes that come in, to do things along these lines are there to do it and they know they're going to failure. The patients, I have to warn, and it really, a VO, there can be um, a single maximum oxygen consumption. So at that day for certain reasons, so it's not really peak, it's not really a VO2 max. It's not the best you can do, but some people will just stop because they're just tired. They just don't want to do it anymore. Some people will stop because they've got, I find some people with, uh, with uh, peripheral vascular disease. I catch people with, with that all the time, they're, they're, their legs go. Um, and so we will do that and they can, we can get data, but again, that's not necessarily your VO2 max. Mm. Um, and we talk about how, that, how to use that data as well. I will I say. I just had a, I know we're out of time. I just had a patient walk in actually. So he's here a little bit early. So I'm going to have to drop off. You two keep talking about all the fun stuff and I will. Hey, uh, thanks, so much. thanks guys. Hey, Thank you. Hey, before we, before we end up, I, I know like historically we do, you know, nuclear stress tests, exercise, stress, mass, nuclear stress, stress echoes, heart caths, uh, et cetera. But life is changing. Cardiology is changing. Um, how do you, and then now we've got uh, CT angiography. What, how, how do you see the future of cardiology changing over the next 10 years? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, it, it, from an imaging standpoint, um, I do find that we are giving up a lot from the basics, the regular treadmill tests, but I, fear that we're giving it up and we need that data as much as anything else. Part of this has to do with um, how much time we're spending with patients. Um, people don't want to spend the time in the treadmill room when they can send somebody off to a, 
to a test this you know, and get data back. Um, the data, the the tests that we have are tremendous, and we're just the coronary CTAs are great. The fact that we've moved now from uh, allowing only high risk people to intermediate risk people to get these tests done are great. Um, the fact that we can do an FFR, uh, so actually measure the amount of blood flow through stenosis, through blockages during a CT scan um, is also fantastic. But again, we have to, we have to measure that against uh, the type of patient we're sending in there and what we're going to be able to do for them and whether or not we've got the right patient for the right test. Um, again, there are times where a regular treadmill test is just as good as going down the highly imaged route uh, so we have to we have to be careful um, who it is we're sending where. Do, do you do fewer or fewer heart caths being done as a result of these new technologies? I think heart caths are being done for better reasons. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, I don't think that people were necessarily being sent for bad reasons. I think we have more data now to say, I think we're more bang for a buck when we send somebody to a heart cath, it's because the coronary CTA has already found a blockage um, that we need to address. Or yeah. the FFR CT has found a significant blockage. We have, um, there's a lot less ambiguity um, in some of the people that we send to perform the heart caths. Yeah. Well, I know we're, we're almost at time. Uh, first off, I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Yisman, for coming. Uh, his website is myheart.life. Uh, and DPC docs out there, if you need a great cardiologist uh, that is a direct specialty cardiologist, you can send him. He's in Denver. Um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations to our fellow specialists? How do, how do they follow your footsteps? Oh, I don't have any recommendations from that. Uh, we want I, more of you. We want more. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm pretty silent in the background. If you need me, I'm always on the phone. I, I think I answer so many questions just if you give me a call. Okay. Um, the, uh, I take a lot of things from that standpoint. The, I, I, uh, I just have, uh, my, like I said, my small practice, which is currently in, literally in the process of moving as we speak. Um, from one location to, into the, the next location. So we'll see what happens. Well, I can't wait until we have gastroenterology, uh, rheumatology, orthopedics, dermatology that are all doing practices like yours. Um, so anyways, thank you so much for your time today, uh, for your expertise, and for taking a leap and joining Direct Specialty Care and Cardiology. Great. Thank you. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us today.